you should um, never trust the person who is hiding in her writing to tell you a story about healing. Um, but here I am, and um, I'm here for this, and I will try to do my best, so be patient with me. I browsed a little bit the editions from previous years, and I'm honored to be here, and I'm looking so much forward to listen to the stories that will come, because I'm convinced that um, they will make us all feel uh, part of something greater, and they will... Um, break borders, and uh, since I'm the one to speak, don't ask me why, <laughs> you should ask Christian, I decided to start uh, low and from the inside. I always uh, believed in healing from the inside, and my story is uh, a wound uh, that took three generations to heal. Since we were strongly encouraged to use uh, visual effects to our presentation, I managed to produce three things. <laughs> uh, and um, these are my three storytellers in the family. Uh, grandmother, mama, and me, by extent. Not the best one, but I'm still trying. Uh, a family that always put uh, valued words above other things. So, I will try to do my best. When I met my grandmother, she was already a very old woman. She was older than other grandmothers around me. Um, small body, like a fist, um, cold blue eyes, silver hair. For me, grandmother was like a messenger from another world, a better world. Uh, which I didn't have a key to. Um, her being old, I, this, this is the thing I liked most about her. I wanted to look like her, I wanted to talk like her, I wanted to be like her. That world where everything was finished, done, in place, properly done, just. And grandma, of course, adored me. I was her only grandchild after she lost two, uh, and I was a girl. <laughs> so she knitted fluffy things for me, she fed me the best placintas in the world, she created for me uh, toys from vegetables and those uh, stunning, irreal um, dresses and costumes from old carpets. But the thing I liked most about her uh, the most magical thing ever was that she was making up stories for me. Every day, during the day, during the night, while she was cooking or just resting under the apricot tree, she was making stories for me. And when she was doing that, um, the story was our land and we felt like we were holding hands all the time. Um, I grew up in those stories, like our children grow at sea or in the mountains. And um, she wasn't good at magic. Uh, after a life like hers, so that is understandable. And she made not happy nor sad stories. Stories were just in the middle, somehow connected to reality. Um, she would talk about the secret cave in a cherry tree which could take you in a few seconds to the end of the world or about um, a son transformed into a spider by his aging mother because he was an ungrateful son, or about the good wizard of the hay, or <laughs> the beautiful but very lazy queen of bees. So they, they were always very connected to reality. Uh, lots of neighbors in those stories, animals, places we knew, like um, lake, forest, uh, hill. I thought that all grandmothers do that. And sometimes children from the village would come to us and try to listen to her, but then the story would stop immediately. It was only for me. And only when I grew up, I understood that she was not just, you know, making stuff. She was preparing me. And she was preparing me for the real story. And in our family, we call it 
the story of a needle. This is a symbolic, as I said, I'm not very good at visual effects, but um, I grew up with that needle in my eyes, literally. It was pinned high in a carpet. Maybe some of you still remember that like, our grandparents used to have carpets on walls. <laughs> so it was pinned there. Above it was only the candle and uh, the icon. And it was there because no one should took it, take it and lose it. That was me. That needle was never used for anything. It was not for working. It was there for seeing it and remembering it. And sometimes she would allow me to climb the window and then take that needle. It was a big needle uh, with a huge eye that could thread anything, even, you know, a life. And sometimes I would feel that in those moments that in that needle is concentrated all her strength and all her life. And if I lose that needle, she would die. And I heard this story of a needle hundreds of times from her and from my mom, different versions, adding things, and I still have it in front of my eyes. It's like, it's like an old photograph, and then I just add color, sounds, or sometimes I just close my eyes and I stare at it and just imagining them all young and ago. And so it starts like this. Um, in July 1949, my, in my grandparents' house, five soldiers came. It was night, they had dogs, but they were generous. They immediately arrested my grandfather, but they gave 10 minutes to my grandmother to put together some things. Um, she was pregnant with her first child, and first thing she took from the house, it was a loaf of bread. And then she fought more and she took some money, and then an icon. And at the end, uh, probably terrified and panicked and confused and I think all, already understanding what's happening to them. She picked up a needle from the table. It was a needle she was repairing some sacks with the night before. It was July, preparation for bread, for harvest, so she was repairing things. And she took that needle and she, she just put it in her, you know, in her nightdress or whatever she was wearing in the night. And those soldiers laughed at her. They said, look, where are you going? You will not be needing money or I can... But you, you know, you can take your needle. <laughs> and she did. She did take that needle. The needle went with her to her only uh, traveling in her life. Um, my grandparents were sent to Siberia, they were deported to hard labor uh, as kulaks, as uh, the enemy of states. They've been um, loaded into a cattle train, or train for cattle, kept there for two weeks. Not only them, lots of enemies of the states there in that train. Uh, the, road lasted for two weeks. And they arrived to Taiga, not all of them. Some of them died, of course. Some of them got insane, lost their minds, um, committed suicide. Uh, it all happened. Uh, my, my grandmother lost her baby, and when she arrived, she was allowed to bury him. So my first thing they did in that new land, grandfather, dug a hole which immediately filled with water. That is down to geography, I suppose, and they just dropped him there. Um, people cried. People prayed. But they started 
to live as well. Uh, they built for themselves a sort of houses and they started a sort of life. Um, then they arrived there, their life was destroyed forever. Not only their life, their children's lives as well. And they were enough to make a sort of village for themselves. But still, it's amazing how much life can go on in a place designed for death. And after weeks, um, they found themselves living. And there, in Taiga, that needle uh, came to life. Everyone seemed to be needing a needle. It's such a small, trivial thing which you can find in each house, but you can't really buy it where they've been. And it's just one of those objects which you cannot buy, but just possess sometimes. And no one thought to take a needle from the house. Only my grandma did. And that needle brought them together. People would come to their barrack, their house, to take it for various things, sad things. Um, they would use it to make clothes for children from clothes of people who died, or to take out splinters from their nails because they were cutting woods every day, to lance boils on their bodies, or to make shoes from the... Uh, tree bark, the needle was needed and somehow it brought them together. It was their story, you know, that simple thing. Instead, my grandparents received warmth, talk, companionship, friendship. Um, and like this for seven years. And then... Um, the hope seemed to vanish. Two miracles happened. Stalin died, and my mom was born. Uh, they called her Vera, which in that language they hated most, meant faith. And she was a little sunny girl in this land of never-ending snow and cold. Sometimes I still feel that cold, you know. And this name was like a laughter in the death's face. Um, after one more year, they, they've been allowed to go back home. Not everyone decided to go back home. Some people just couldn't bring themselves to go back in the place that did that or to see the people that sent them there, or to see the people who didn't send them there, but still didn't do anything to stop them being sent there. But my grandparents decided to go back to no house, to no name, to no status for many, many years, but still in a country they called home. My grandmother was telling me that most things she missed was the sun. So the journey back took again one month, and in her arms she had the little Vera, but in her pocket, like an external heart, like a second child, she had the needle. She came back home and continued its life. And now that needle is with my mom, and it will come to me when the time comes. Um, Grandma died a happy woman. This is what she told us, at least, and I want to believe that. Um, becoming a journalist, um, you, you might think that it's connected to everything I told you, but it's not. The sad truth is that I'm very rubbish at math and chemistry, so that ruled out the possibility of becoming a doctor. That would really make my parents proud. 
Instead, I was talking a lot, too much, as they say, and um, I was writing, okay, so that was um, somehow the easiest thing to do. Journalism seemed to me the right thing, and I still believe that for people like me, the journalism is the right thing. It's awesome to be you know, asking your questions, getting answers, and being paid. And uh, in those years, I worked as a journalist, I think, uh, I'm very grateful for that period in my life. It was one of the best. Um, when I said that I'm going to become a journalist, my father said, no way. I mean, he was the biggest opponent. He is a journalist himself, retired at the time. But he tried to scare me with all the downsides of his job from what he remembered in Soviet times, like lots of field trips to Kolhoz, Lots of cold, uh, late hours, um, no time with family. Uh, people will annoy you. People will be avoiding you. Anyway, I became a journalist, and my first great article in the national paper was about pigeon in the central park of Chisinau. <laughs> I, uh, I improved in time, I promise you. <laughs> I moved to a TV station where I worked for 15 years, or no, 10 or 12 years as a reporter on social issues. It's amazing how much you can go in this social issue field. Uh, as an anchor uh, and as an editor. And I can see that now you want to reconnect with the needle and you want to ask me, so what did she do with that story? How did she bring it out? What did it change in my life, in family's life, in society's life? Well, my answer is nothing. I did nothing with it. Nothing. For all those years, I had hundreds of reportage documentaries. I met thousands of people, but I never did anything about that story. Um, more than that, every time I could, I had an occasion to start a debate, to make a show, to make a serious investigation, I would just push it. I never want to do anything about Siberia and deportees. Um, I could use my popularity, I could use the TV station's popularity to make a change, but I choose to do nothing. And 20 years ago, that would really make a difference in Moldova. Other people did, other journalists did, and I'm so uh, grateful to them. But I didn't. I decided that there, other stuff, there is other stuff more interesting for me. So in other words, I failed. Grandma, I failed. Mom, I felt myself to, you know, to speak in the right moment and really make a difference. Um, moving uh, to Paris was not easy, nor particularly desired. <laughs> I did not speak the language. I was not very young. I, uh, I knew that I will never work in a French television, um, not at at least not at the same level as I used to be in Moldova. I still moved. I left my uh, parents, being the only daughter. I left my uh, friends and I left my city and that, believe me, felt like I cut a limb. Uh, I still miss Chisinau very much. So in Paris, uh, I was doing lots of stuff. Uh, I liked being there. It was a new city. I wanted to be cosmopolitan. I wanted to embrace the world, to see other things. This story of the needle seems so provincial, so far away, so not mine. Why, why do I need to carry it with me everywhere? I didn't want to be seen as a, you know, this kind of another drama, Eastern European who is coming and just boring us with all these things. Uh, I just wanted to do other stuff, something which would fit my new role, my new home, my new husband, my, you know, this Parisian life. 
Funnily enough, my new job, which I found a creative job, a great job, was about writing human stories. <laughs> so I continued, in a way, to be a journalist. I would meet people, interesting people, encouraging them to tell me their stories, uh, family stories or professional stories or success stories. Um, sometimes I meet one fantastic person and then five less fantastic people, but still you will have to produce equally fantastic six stories. <laughs> so those of you who are journalists or are doing this, you know that sometimes uh, you need to work hard to make a person to look good. And I did that. I loved that. It was probably another hiding place for me to uh, make other stories brilliant instead of doing something with my families. So in one of those days when I was writing a half interesting story, let's put it like that, my mom called and she asked me, so what are you doing? And I said, look, this is exactly what I'm doing. Not in very nice words, <laughs> I said. She didn't talk much, but she said something like, ah, so you are doing this instead of writing about the needle. And that really got to me, you know, because she was right, of course. Um, she was right. Uh, and I said, why do I have to write it? It's your story. You are born there. You can write as well. Uh, it's your parents. Uh, it's your tragedy. I'm not so much involved, so I was very irritated and I said, look, don't ask me again. I know what I'm doing. You can write it. So we left it there, but the question stayed with me and went in my head round and round and I was asking myself, look, honestly, why, why are you resisting? Why are you resisting this extraordinary testimonial? And I was asking myself, why don't I write anything about it? Is it because I'm afraid I'm not good enough? Is it because I'm afraid that the story is not good enough? What change from childhood when my mom, grandmother hold my hand and told me this story which I found fantastic, what changed? Story changed or did I change? And I think it was both actually, because without her there, I couldn't find that middle that was so that is still so important for me in life and in relationship to other people and in my writing, that middle. I didn't want to write a story. I want to make a story which will make justice. And I felt that I'm not ready for it. I couldn't make justice because I was not a just person. I had so many questions and no answers. It wasn't a story to be trifled with. Ten years passed with lots of other things. And when my daughter, Sophia, was born in Paris, my mom came and brought me seven um, textbooks. This is the first one. I didn't bring them all. These are my textbooks from university, you know, mom. Moms keep everything in the house, so she kept everything I ever owned. It's like a museum there. So she ripped off some of her um, pages and the blank ones she filled with her hand handwriting. So these are her memories about Siberia. These are her memories about coming back from Siberia, about how it was to grow up as a daughter of enemies of the states, not only her, but many other children, how difficult it was for her to build a life, to find a job. How difficult it was for her um, to leave with that stamp on her forehead. Um, and it's about how she forgave but not forget. And she didn't nag me again, you should write this story. She just gave me this and said, you should give them to grandchildren when the time comes, maybe 
they will read it. She didn't say maybe they will do something, but she said maybe they will read it. And, and it's a little bit um, bizarre for me because these are in Romanian. My children speak poor Romanian. Of course, they are small, and I hope that it will, this will change. But for the time being, Romanian is their fourth language, put it like that. And, and I thought that, you know, that's how much she trusts them. Even so, she's giving this to them, not to me anymore. This is exactly how my grandmother trusted me with that story. Because she knew she will die soon. She knew that maybe I will become a doctor and I will never write anything. But she still gave me this. She entrusted me with this. And then I realized why I cannot connect with this story. Why can't I write a book about the needle? It's because I don't know who I am. My grandmother knew. My mom knew. She knows. But I didn't know because I grew up differently. I grew up in two cultures, in two languages. One of them being the language of people who tried to exterminate my family and the language I should hate and the language I could hate because the time came and the time was right. But I didn't find in me so much rage and I didn't find in me that desire of revenge, not enough to write the book as they wanted it. I understood that I didn't want to write a book like a gun. I wanted to write a book like a hug. I wanted to write a book not from the perspective of a granddaughter, but from a perspective of a person I became. And I wanted to put their values, which I believe now. If I am to transmit something, I'd like to do justice with that story and to transmit things I believe in. I wrote a book when my first novel came out, and it was a success. <clears throat> um, I felt that I cheated again. <laughs> it's a book that could be written by anyone. Um, it has no geography, no time frame. The characters are Polish from London. The action is taking place in north of France. Um, I wrote it in Romanian, it's true, but then again, um, who is the author? I am a Romanian born in Moldova, living in Paris with her British husband. So <laughs> you really need to be a very good PR manager to sell that, right? Um, it was a book which um, liberated me and I put there lots of fears and lots of um, hopes and I always felt that it's a book like a letter for my children in the future. But again, it has no connection with what I wanted to write. I was prepared in a way to write. And that went on and on. Um, I just wanted to, to understand for me and for the others, uh, who are these people brought in two cultures and in two identities. And then I moved to Paris. I understood how important is this for me because um, I have children that don't really connect already with my past in the same way, but it will be a moment when I will want to tell them who I am and who, where I'm coming from. And for that, I need to answer those questions which very justly were asked from journalists, they came, so do you consider yourself uh, Romanian or Russian? Does Moldovan language exist? I hate this question. Um, so what is your birthplace? Do you consider home to be home in Romania or in Paris? And last year, I made a very, very, very small step towards healing. Um, I wrote this book. Um, it's a step towards 
my family healing, my own family, my own healing, but I dare say in a very small uh, way uh, to a collective healing. It's again not the book my family wanted, but it's a book which contains something very precious to me. It contains that honest middle. It contains that middle where I'm not hiding anymore. And I think that I couldn't do anything else and write anything else if I wouldn't write this book. I realized when I was writing this book that a family wound or a nation's wound it's not easy to heal and it takes more than one generation because healing requires pain and suffering and struggling, but also forgiveness and acceptance and making peace with yourself. And I also understood that having a family story, a strong family story or a nation's story can be a burden, can um, stop you from many of your dreams, can stop you sometimes, but then, you know, help you to go further. But also it can be um, um, a very strong uh, inspirational and motivational uh, source. Um, I can feel that I'm getting useless with this speech, so I will probably try to uh, finish, but I would like to finish uh, with this uh, bit which Christian stole from me, and he read it because I prepared it, but maybe you will want to hear it from me. It's a bit which um, actually defines uh, women in my family and defines me, and I just hope that grandma, wherever she is now, uh, probably under some apricot tree, um, will trust me that I'm doing my best and with this bit, I will go there. I will come to that story, but in my own time. And just before reading it, I encourage you to, to talk to your parents and grandparents while you still have them. Um, even if I don't tell you, as you think at the moment, great stories, but these are your stories and you won't be given better ones. You can create better ones for your children, but if you don't know the stories from your grandparents and parents, you will feel incomplete. And, and I will read this fragment now, because this was my grandmother. And if I'm not going to be at the same standard, I hope that maybe my children will be one day. Um, there are people in this world who simply cannot live without telling stories. For them, these people, always beautiful and usually insane, life needs to be a story. Because only there, between, between its soft, enchanted ribs, can they accept evil and pain, sickness and the betrayal? Because they know. They know that the story never leaves things unresolved. Even the shortest, saddest story always makes sure that things are put right. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here and listening to me and to us. <laughs> Thank you.